what would the Founding Fathers be thinking about the future of our government? Our next speaker will give us some clues and an updated perspective. She's a professor of political science and public policy at Brown University, where she researches the U.S. Senate and interest group influence on trade politics. Here is Dr. Wendy Schiller. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, I'm technology challenged, I'm going to warn you. And I speak very quickly as a matter of life. So feel free, I'm from New York originally, just to say slow down, just scream it out and I will take it down a notch. And when I get very excited, I speak very quickly. So feel free to do that. I was told uh, I need to slow it down here. So it's, what time is it now? It's quarter of three, are you exhausted? You're not even a little bit tired. I'm freezing, I know, but I'm only here for 20 minutes, so um, you stay awake a little. When I, I actually tell you a secret, I, I teach at Brown University, which is in Providence, Rhode Island, the Northeast, and it's very cold in the winter, but I tell plant facilities to turn off the heat in my classes in the morning because the kids stay awake. <laughs> they bring sweatshirts and they stay awake. So I'm going to try to do the same thing today for you um, without the sweatshirts. The politics of empowerment, from Kate Haney to the Tea Party movement. Literally, what would the founders say about these people, about uh, individuals and movements that are in the 21st century and changing your life? Does anybody know? Well, I'm not going to do this first. I'm going to go forward first. Okay, Thomas Jefferson. I am not partial to any particular founder. I like them all, but I'm going to start with Thomas Jefferson. And I like this first sentence, the absolute best sentence, I think, of this paragraph. I am persuaded myself that the good sense of the people will always be found to be the best army. You don't have to have weapons to be an army in a democracy. Just get organized and participate. That is all Jefferson was saying. Jefferson was a huge fan of the people. He didn't always think the people will know what's best. Um, but he says here, even, even their errors will tend to keep these to the true principles of their institution. In other words, better to trust the people, even when they're wrong, than trust elected leaders over the people in any given instance, in any given era of American politics. So, the story of Kate Haney. Who knows who Kate Haney is? Has anyone heard of her? Okay, does anybody fly in this room? Like on an airplane, not fly the airplane, but fly in an airplane. Okay, so do you know when you get stuck on the tarmac and you're really irritated and there's no food? There's no food on airplanes anymore anyway, but no food, no water. You're like stuck, stuck, stuck. You'd rather, you can see the gate from the airplane and you just want to get off and walk to the gate. Well, the airlines can no longer keep you on the tarmac for more than two hours without food and water and three hours maximum. If they exceed three hours by even a minute, they will be fined $27,500 per passenger on the plane. Ask United Airlines, they were on the tarmac for three hours and five minutes, and the FAA nailed them. Why? Because of Kate Haney. This one person changed the way we fly. So if she can change the way we all fly, we can all be effective and active, either in a civic context or a political context. Kate Haney, this is from her, Get Involved. You have no idea what you can accomplish until you become unstoppable. The book is actually a textbook, an introductory to American politics textbook that's coming out in a month that I'm a co-author on that I'm not selling to you because you're not in college, most of you. So, but it is coming out, and she's quoted prominently in it. And it's a fascinating story of a woman who was on vacation with her family, Christmas time, going on vacation, gets stuck in Austin, by the way, for nine hours on a plane. Nine hours. She gets so angry, she couldn't believe nobody was gonna get them off the plane. Nobody helped them. In response, she, she finishes her trip, finally gets off the plane, finishes the trip, and sponsors a group called flyersrights.org and lobbies for something called the Airline Passengers Bill of Rights. She mortgaged her house with her husband. She quit her job as a real estate agent, mortgaged the house to start um, this organization. And we're going to go to this organization if technology is good to us. Excellent. It's working. I love the little ticker. That's why I wanted to show this to you. I just think the ticker. This ticker tells you everything that's happening that the federal government is doing about travel. Bus, train, plane. 
And this is the best website for consumer protection, and it's a private website. It's her website. And that's a picture of her. We don't have time to play it, but she explains her story. One of the most clever things she did, first of all, she mortgages the house. She puts up the website. Within six months, she gets 18,000 signatures, uh, web signatures of, of support on the website. She gets her senator, Senator Barbara Boxer in California. She gets her congressperson to sponsor bills in Congress to, to have the Airlines Passengers Bill of Rights. These bills are folded into a bigger bill that is passed by Congress but not enacted into law. And on May, in May of 2010, um, the Department of Transportation issues regulations that prohibit airlines from keeping you on a plane for lo longer than three hours on a tarmac. Now, one of the key things she did that was so clever, has anybody in, been into Washington, D.C. in the summertime? I know Houston's bad, but have you been there in the summer? It's hot. She built a fake airplane on the mall, you know, the big mall with all the museums? She built an airplane in July. No food, no water, and smelly porta potties right outside the airplane. And she invited all of the media, big media, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, all the media, and she invited every member of Congress to come sit in the plane to see what it felt like to be trapped on a plane under very um, strict and difficult circumstances. Can, you can imagine that there's probably very few Congress people who've ever been trapped on a plane, who didn't find some way to get them to turn the plane around and get them off the plane. So she invited them. Many Congress people came because of the media opportunities. They sit in this fake plane, and they don't last, she says, more than 10 minutes. They're out of there. They can't stand it. So as they're running out of this fake airplane, she has a clipboard, literally, that says, oh, would you please um, promise to co-sponsor the Airline Passenger Bill of Rights before you leave with the Fox camera staring them right in the face. <laughs> She's a smart woman. And she did this because she was angry. She wanted to be empowered. How come the federal bureaucracy wasn't helping her? The Federal Aviation Agency, why did they let airlines do this to people who pay to fly? And they all signed, all of them. As they're racing out, uh, none of them said, I don't have time. They stopped, they signed, and they left. And that's how she built momentum over a three-year period to pass a law. And the bill passed strongly enough, even though it didn't get signed in for technical reasons into law, that the federal government decided to take action. That's empowerment. Individual democracy with a, with a, a little d, democracy empowerment. Okay, now we can leave the website, if we're lucky technologically. And we're not being lucky technologically. Good thing I do this for a living, so I can handle it. Oh, good. Um, so this is what I told you about the 27500 per passenger. I think United Airlines literally was levied a $2 million fine. That they're appealing, but it's still in play. Okay, parties, you can't, it's a lot of text. I'm just going to... You know, how many people here have a good, warm, fuzzy feeling about the American political parties today? So, and if you're going to read one thing, one thing from the founding period, if you haven't read anything else, just one thing to understand what the vision was for democracy, read George Washington's farewell address. If you go to Yale University's website, it's called the Avalon Project. They have a number of documents there. This is there. It's easy. You just click on it. It's right there. It's not that long. My students tell me it's a little long, but it's not that long. It is uh, written by, actually, Alexander Hamilton for the most part, but Washington did a good job editing it. Understand what he says here about political parties. I'm going to say they. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. In 2010, that means gridlock. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. That's political parties in 1796. So he hated them. He thought they were horrible. And he says a fire not to be quenched can burst into flame and it will consume everything to the point where people who used to be friends can't talk to each other anymore. Oh, you're Republican, I'm Democrat, you're Tea Party, whatever you are, well, I don't believe what you believe, so we can't be friends, we can't hang out, we can't discuss politics anymore. A democracy needs, as its basis, a fabric of coherence, of unity, of shared beliefs and values. If you don't believe that policy should be implemented in the same way, you at least share the, the belief that the government is legitimate and you trust the government. 
Once you break those bonds, once people genuinely view each other as so different that they have nothing left in common, you shred the fabric of democracy. And that is what Washington thought political parties did to American politics, or would do. Okay, this is, this is funny. I would say it's an old map, but it's not that old. February 2010, is, this is a massive Gallup poll that generated this map. It's a little hard to see, but it's not very accurate anymore because you see a lot of blue as a majority in this map. And this is how many people in America define themselves as a Republican or a Democrat, February 2010. Still, the Democrats define themselves, the Democrats have a majority in people who will say I'm a Democrat. Not necessarily voting Democratic this year, but say they're a Democrat. That is starting to shift a little bit, uh, particularly in the Midwest, um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois. But what's interesting about that is how quickly it can change. The idea that you were the party of your father and your mother, or that your children will be the same party as you, and that it will be a stable preference across your lifetime is outdated. Voters are showing us time and time again that it is not sticky anymore. We have this term in political science and economics, stickiness. Party is not so sticky anymore. People are moving away from identifying themselves and their beliefs in a party framework. Okay, primary turnout. Um, I cannot possibly have just nine minutes left. That's not possible. I just want to point out two things on this chart. The Republicans turned out in big numbers this year. The Democrats did not. That makes sense, given that the Democratic Party was the incumbent party. They tend to have less primary challenges than the Republican. But it shows you something about a precursor to um, how many people will vote on Election Day. So let's not forget, primaries may be divisive, and they may be not very pretty at times, but they mobilize voters. So if you're going to mobilize to vote in a primary, you're already registered, you already know where the polling place is, you are much more likely to vote in the general election. So having divisive primaries, and lots of them, benefits the party in general turnout terms, which is why we expect maybe a two-to-one turnout in, across the board, Republican versus Democratic, in the November elections. Okay, what's interesting here is the highest and lowest primary turnout by political party. We see that the only state in common is Washington State for the top four, and they are um, relatively equivalent. Vastly different states are turning out to vote in the parties. And what that tells you is that this year, even though we have national labels and what's national issues, the politics will still be local. The state politics will still be local. Who turns out which party gets people out to vote? National distribution of Tea Party candidates. This is what I like to tell my friends from New England, the East Coasters, that believe the Tea Party is just somewhere else, not anywhere near them, because they tend to be a little liberal at Brown. So um, just a little. But that is a whole other lecture that I could give. Um, anyway, getting back on track. Um, this, is, this is cool. Tea Party people are people who identify or affiliate with Tea Party principles. Let's not forget, there's no one Tea Party. There's no leader of the Tea Party. There's no Ross Perot leading a third party. This is a, an amalgamation of a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. But this shows you, the New York Times says there's 129 candidates for the House that have identified with Tea Party, and nine for the Senate. That's a big number. It's a big number for a party that just sort of popped up a year and a half ago. And they're all over the country. They may not be everywhere, but the middle of the country is sparsely populated anyway. Still, there are a lot of places people don't think they are. And I would argue that's a good thing for democracy. Normatively, it's a good thing in terms of participation. So who are these Tea Party candidates? Now, I want to go to the first website, the Faces and Philosophies of Tea Party Candidates. Just to give you an idea of the differences within the Tea Party, I do not believe the Tea Party is going anywhere as a political and civic movement. I'm not sure how much actual policy impact the Tea Party people will have. But I want you to want to point out, those are five different categories that you can put Tea Party people in. Five different categories. Newcomers, not really a good category. Newly energized, conservative, constitutionalists, and libertarians. How many times would you say the Republican Party could be divided into five categories? Or the Democratic Party? These are some of the faces that belong to the Tea Party, the most prominent people. I like this one, in hot water. Um, so 
Um, so you see, Sharon Angle is hanging in. I mean, every day that poll changes. If you're a pol politics junkie, um, in a good way, junkie in a good way, RealClearPolitics.com Real Clear has the biggest, most efficient database. The New York Times is good, the Wall Street Journal is good, but Real Clear Politics has it. And today the polls show that Angle and Reid are fairly even. Christine O'Donnell is, is sinking pretty fast. But look at the faces. We have different gender. We have different region. We have different mistakes. We have different you know, good things and bad things surrounding this party. This is remarkable. When was the last time you saw so much diversity in people running for office on the ballot in American politics? It's been a long time since you've had a lot of different ideas floating around. OK, we're going to leave this website, if we can. See, we're going straight to the web, and it's causing a little bit of delay, so I apologize for that. Um, OK, good. What I just wanted to say is the same website, the New York Times Tea Party website, I'm not sure anyone ever thought you would have those things together, New York Times Tea Party website. Um, but if you, if you scroll down, I mean, I, I, of course, thought this was cool, but that's just me. If you scroll down, it tells you all about each candidate. And it, what it tells you, more importantly, is what's going on in the country politically, in different districts, in different states all over the country. Who's doing what? Who's running for office? What are they saying? How will this affect what the Congress does in the next two years? If you want to learn about the Tea Party, don't just tea party, have one Tea Party. Look and see, and see what they're going to do. Marco Rubio is going to win that election in Florida. He's going to be a United States senator. Will it be a Tea Party or a Republican Party senator? That's going to matter when the Senate's divided 52-48 in either direction. That would be my prediction. OK, we're going to leave this website. I just wanted to make one more point about the Tea Party. Oh, we don't need the list of Tea Party candidates. I might actually make time. So this is, again, I'm sorry for all the numbers. I know it can be distracting. It's definitely a bad professorial tendency. But I want to tell you one thing. Um, eligible citizens voting in the primaries thus far, 65 million. 3 million, nearly 3 million 700,000 people cast votes for the Tea Party candidates. That's not a small number. Not a small number. How many, number, how many votes did Al Gore lose the presidency by in Florida? A lot fewer. Anybody who thinks the Tea Party is not a real movement or won't have an impact is not paying attention. And that simple number tells you that. That's a lot of votes. OK, I wanted to put all three questions up at once. Usually for the kids, I fade it in to create suspense. But, but you guys are adults, so I don't think you need the suspense. I want you to think about these questions when you're talking about politics and we talk about the American democracy which is still the greatest, most grand, natural experiment in politics that civilization has ever seen. It's still the freest country on the planet. It's 200, I did the math this morning for the kids, 234 years old. And we have had peaceful transitions of power from parties that differ greatly from each other. So in, in a very important way, we have defied Washington's prediction about bloodbaths and violence in changing political control. The other predictions he was pretty much right on about, but those, thankfully, he's been wrong about. So how much civic and political involvement is necessary to sustain a democracy? A lot. If you don't like the way things are, but you don't vote, you can't complain. You relinquish it. I used to work for a senator from New York, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late senator, and he used to say, voting is a privilege, and it should be viewed as such. People line up in Iraq and Afghanistan to vote, and they risk their lives to vote. Yet America is still at about 61, 62% eligible voting population that votes. Everybody in America should participate in whatever way they feel comfortable. That is the greatest security for the democracy. Without it, if we have diminishing participation over time, the actual democracy that we live in, I think, is threatened. This is a big question, particularly back in the Northeast. <laughs> How can government so large actually work for the average individual? I think what you're seeing now is that it doesn't work that well for the individual. Even at the most local levels, government has gotten so big that voters feel completely detached from it. They don't feel they're getting something from it. They don't feel that they can hold elected officials accountable. They don't know where money goes. That's dangerous for a democracy because it undermines trust and legitimacy in government. That's something both parties have to think about, Democrats much more so. 
Democrats have to really figure out in the 21st century, does their philosophy that the government should help or the government should perform services, is it actually doable in a country of 308 million people? Certainly none of the founders would ever have believed the federal government would get as big as it did. Jefferson would have been just apoplectic. I can't even tell you what Benjamin Franklin would have said. He would have just gone over the deep end. And I, I mean, whether you're liberal or conservative, it doesn't matter. They never would have expected the federal government to be this big. Never. Because I don't know that they thought it was going to work. They knew the country would be big geographically. They knew that it would grow in population size. They knew all these things. But I don't think they knew that the government would become this big. Time is up. Well, not quite. <laughs> Last thing. Is the Tea Party a healthy development of the political party structure in America? I always think when, the, when people who are in office in a party have to wake up and respond to a force outside where they are, that's a good thing for democracy, for both parties, Republican and Democrat. So since you just applauded, I'm going to stop now because <laughs> my time is up. <laughs> No, no, you have to applaud again. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Um, quick, quick question for you. So, so you intuit, you predict that the Tea Party is not viable maybe for the long term, but do you see a time when we might have a three-party system or a multiple-party system that's viable and thriving in the States? And if so, when? I'm not willing to say that the Tea Party is not viable as a party, because if you elect people who self-identify as Tea Party people, and they win an election to the U.S. Senate, or they win election to the U.S. House, it's hard for them to sustain a massive party. But if they keep running under that label and they keep winning, then you have to say that it becomes viable. The history of American political parties all the way through has been that the big parties figure out how to swallow up or in the Republican case in 1854, remake themselves into a different party and take all the good ideas from the third party movement, swallow them up, take credit, transform themselves, and sustain a two party movement. And so since the ballot access, by the way, ballot laws, ballot access is controlled by state legislators who are predominantly from the two major parties. So it's very difficult to make any kind of structural change that would create a more competitive party environment. But I would not count the Tea Party out just yet. Okay, thanks so much, Wendy Schiller. Thank you.